Um, super uh, thankful just uh, to have this time together. You know, um, uh, it's been really great actually having our, our, our married midweeks together. And it's funny in the breakout rooms had opportunities to be with some of you and to be able to share uh, just about what's going on in our marriages and um, really just about how we can grow and be better as husbands and wives and better together in our marriages. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super thankful to have Brian and Lauren in Dayton. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's been my prayer, my heart's desire for for years that that somebody would be in Dayton who loves that city, loves that church, and uh, it's just obvious to everybody that Brian and Lauren have given their heart, not just to the church, but to the city, and I uh, really appreciate that. Um, my, uh, yeah, my, my whole upbringings in Dayton, um, all my family, in fact, uh, tomorrow I'm going to be doing a funeral for my aunt who just passed away this past week uh, up in Tip City. Uh, she, she was actually in a, in a uh, care facility in Centerville, but she's going to be, uh, uh, the service is going to be in Tip City. She'll be buried in Vandalia. And uh, my cousins contacted me, asked if I would do the funeral. So I'll be doing that. But it's just a reminder to me that that all, all of my roots uh, and all my family go back to Dayton. And, um, you know, I love, I love Dayton so much. It's funny, when I was talking with uh, uh, Rusty and Kim Snell, who actually tomorrow started officially leading the church in Toledo, I said, uh, I told him, I said, Toledo is, is a lot like Dayton. It's just further north and colder, um, but very, very similar cities, uh, you know, just kind of blue collar cities, uh, just to solve the earth people. And so very excited that uh, they're going to lead the church in Toledo, really looking forward to that. You know, I have to share something that's uh, kind of funny because um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you guys uh, today. But last year, I had actually talked with Sean uh, Kirkland. I said, you know, Sean, um, you really need to give me less speaking slots in the rotation. I said, I said, you really need to be preaching at least twice a month. Uh, you're the lead evangelist. The church needs to hear you. And I said, and then we've got the young guys that really need to be given a shot. Uh, and I said, look, I've done lots of service for the year. So, so honestly, if you want to give me a spot, like maybe once every couple months, that would really be fine. And, uh, and so that's what's happened. I, I, I preached down here maybe once every couple months, but since that's happened, um, I, I, I've gotten invitations. You know, I'm speaking in Dayton this week, the end of the month. I'm speaking for the Columbus service. Jennifer and I did a marriage retreat for the Pittsburgh and Nittany Valley Church. Um, we're doing the midweek this Wednesday, and then we've been asked to teach a class on empty nesters for uh, for a New England marriage retreat. And I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm trying to ease out of speaking, and it seems like God's like, no, 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 uh, we're going to keep giving you the, uh, these opportunities, so I don't know, I may need to send it like a mass email saying, I'm not speaking anymore, okay, I don't know, whatever, but uh, I do want to share, uh, you know, uh, Brian mentioned that Jennifer is doing great, you can see her, uh, she looks beautiful, um, she's really uh, just continuing to, to do well, um, She's had five clear scans since her chemo end, ended uh, a year ago. So we're very, very thankful. Thank you for all of your prayers. Really just appreciate that. And, and uh, you know, uh, Tracy uh, Page has been just a great uh, kind of partner through this. And they've had some talks. And so very, very grateful for that. Our kids are doing awesome. Our son and daughter uh, and our daughter-in-law and grandson are now in San Antonio, Texas. After leading the Church of Madrid for four years, uh, they come back. They're leading a region of the San Antonio Church, so they're doing great. They love it there. Um, they thought they'd moved to San Antonio to warm weather, and they got the worst winter weather maybe in the history. Um, so, uh, but uh, they're doing great. And then our daughter and and her husband are in Nashville, and uh, she's expecting our second grandson next month. So uh, we're going to be uh, grandparents times two. So we're very excited about that. But I wanted to. Uh, you know, share a little bit today, you know, uh, we're going through uh, the book, Jesus the Same. And, uh, you know, I'd read that book many, many years ago. It's actually been a long time since I read it, but rereading it has been very inspiring, uh, very convicting, and, and really, in many ways, just made me fall in love with Jesus all over again and stand in awe of how truly incredible he is. Today, we're going to be looking at the strength of Jesus. 
you know, usually when we hear the word strength, we, we tend to think of, of, of physical strength. You know, like, like you, you look at a mirror's wall and you see his medals hanging there. You're like, okay, the dude's a runner. Like he's, he's got his trophies. Uh, and, and look, Jesus, he was the son of a carpenter, probably worked in the carpenter shop. So he definitely uh, would have been strong. Um, we know he walked long distances. Uh, he climbed mountains. Uh, you agree, if you walked on water, that's pretty impressive. Uh, you would talk about, a, a, you know, like an Iron Man. I mean, Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't swim the distance. He just walked on the water. Um, and he was impressive enough to get fishermen who are definitely kind of the, you know, the rough, rough, tough guys to follow him when he called them. Uh, you know, we see him going into the, into the temple, overturning uh, tables in the temple. Jesus was definitely not a wimp. And I remember when, uh, when we were in Baltimore, we led the church in Baltimore for a while. We met um, for midweeks at this old Lutheran church. And at, at the very front of the sanctuary, on this probably 40-foot high wall, they had this huge uh, painting of Jesus. And he was like really pale white. And, and just looked really kind of weak and wimpy and effeminate. Now you have to understand uh, the Baltimore church at the time was probably about 75% African American. So you've got this Jesus up there on the, on the wall that, that looks nothing like anybody in the church. And honestly, nothing like somebody that you would want to follow and be like. Uh, and, and, and it always bothers me how Jesus is portrayed uh, so many times, but the thing about Jesus' strength was the thing that drew people to him wasn't his physical strength. In fact, in Isaiah 53, it says there was nothing in his appearance that would cause us to be in awe of him. It wasn't like people looked at Jesus and said, wow, what, what a strong guy. I, I, I want to follow him. You know, Jesus also, he had emotional strength. Um, you know, we know that he was raised by, by a single mother for at least a good portion of his life. Um, you know, he, he had to deal with uh, uh, some sibling rivalry uh, that can always be challenging. As many of us know, you know, extended family sometimes can be, present some tough challenges. Uh, he had high expectations from birth, right? Son of God, uh, never, never sinned, saved the world. Uh, he was under incredible pressure. He was attacked. He was ridiculed. Uh, he was rejected. He, he poured himself out for people to the point that, that he truly had intense empathy and love so that when someone else was going through at that time, Jesus really felt it. And yet, that's not the source of his strength either. You know, I think sometimes we can look at Jesus and we kind of think he's like Black Panther or Captain America or, or, or Wonder Woman, right? He's, he's this superhuman uh, and, you know, with supernatural powers that, that, that we can't relate to at all. And yet Hebrews chapter two says that, that he was flesh and blood, that he was just like us, that, that he was tempted in every way, just like we were, that, that Jesus went through the same things that we went through. So today I want us to focus in on the spiritual strength of Jesus. The character, the heart, what, what made Jesus so strong spiritually? And turn over to Mark chapter 1, and we'll read here in verse 21. Mark 1, verse 21. It says, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue, and he began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. You know, two different times here, it says that the people were amazed at Jesus. But what was amazing about him? 
Well, first of all, it was his teaching. It was powerful. It was practical. It was relatable. It was uncompromising. It was the scripture, but it brought the scriptures alive. You know, I remember growing up and going to the Bellbrook Presbyterian Church. And I thought the Bible was the most boring book in the history of mankind because of the way it was presented. And yet, when I, when I study the Bible, when I, when I heard the word preached for the first time by people who were living it out, you know what? It inspired me. I'm like, man, the Bible's amazing. God's amazing. This is what I want for my life. And I, I really believe that one of the worst sins somebody can commit is to make the Bible boring. Because I believed it comes alive in amazing ways. So Jesus did that. But the other thing, they were amazed about his authority. Jesus' authority did not come from strong opinions. It didn't come from a title or a position. His authority was based on the word of God, and it was based on the life that he led. Let me repeat that. His authority was based on the word of God that when he spoke, he spoke the word of God, and it was based on his life. In fact, at one time when he's being attacked, he even says, look, can any of you convict me of sin? He's like, if you don't want to listen to what I say, then check out my life. My life gives me the authority to say what I say. You know, it's interesting, even in Matthew 16, when Jesus puts the question out, he says, who do people say that I am? They say, well, they say, people say John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. In other words, Jesus reminded people of some of the most powerful men in the history of God's kingdom. Jesus, it says here, was amazing. People were amazed at him. You know, I looked this up. If you look in the concordance at, you know, amazing or amazed, it appears 36 times, this word, in the Gospels. 34 of them refer to Jesus. And the other two times it shows up is when it says Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. So, so, so during Jesus' time, they're like, he's the most amazing person ever. But what was the secret to the strength of Jesus, the secret to his spiritual strength? Well, turn over to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Number one, his strength was rooted in his relationship to the Father. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and, they'll not lift you up, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. You know, Jesus is praying. He's fasting. He's rooted in the word of God. And so when Satan comes at him, what's what happens? He's able to overcome temptation. He's strong enough to overcome temptation, not because he's superhuman, but because what? He's relying on the Father in prayer. He's fasting to draw close to God. When temptation is thrown his way, he's got scriptures ready to combat the temptation. We see this throughout the ministry of Jesus. And then you see him at the end of his ministry, in the end of his life, in the garden. And it's very striking because in the garden, you've got Jesus praying, and he does well spiritually. You've got 
the apostles who are supposed to be praying, and instead they're sleeping, and they what? They do terrible spiritually at the moment. And, and sometimes we feel like, well, it's Jesus, and then it's Peter, James, and John. I'm like, no, it's Jesus with the Father, and Peter and James and John relying on their own strength. You know, too many times we, we, we want to rely on our own, own strength to get through stuff, to push through, you know, to, 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 to buckle down, to tough up, to, to get through. We don't realize that the strength that we need in life comes from our reliance on the Father, just like Jesus. You know, for the last year and a half, it's, it's not been an easy time for the Lambert family. Uh, we, we've gone through stuff that, that, that we've never gone through. And, and we live, honestly, with the, with the ongoing uncertainty uh, of pancreatic cancer. You know, every three months, Jeff has a scan and we pray about it. But, but there's this kind of uncertainty of, well, okay, she's good now. Is that going to always be the case? And we, we'll, we'll never hear what we want to hear, which is, uh, she'll never, the cancer will never come back. The doctors made that very, very clear to us. And we've had people ask us, well, how have you guys, how have you guys done so well during this? And people have been encouraged and inspired. But let me tell you something. It's not because we're tough physically. The fact is we're not. And Jennifer, Jennifer would amen that. It's not that we're extra tough emotionally. Like we're, we're just really strong people emotionally. We, We've had tough times and we've shed tears and, and there's been times when it's been really hard It's because we have prayed like crazy. It's because we have dug into the word of God. Our strength comes from God. You know what? There's nothing, there's nothing to be glorified about how we've handled this. Cause I'll tell you this right now, take God away from us, take godly people away from us. And I don't, I have no idea how we would do it. I mean, I literally don't know how we would do it. But let me ask you a question. How have you done spiritually during the COVID pandemic? How have you done spiritually? Let's look at Matthew chapter seven for a second. And I think this is going to be very challenging for many of us. Because the reality is, I think a lot of us have not done well. A lot of us have struggled, and, and, and we think it's because of COVID, because of the pandemic, because we've not been able to meet together, because of, of, of all the different things that have gone on. And so we're like, well, it, it, it's real, I'm really struggling because of. But look at what it says in Matthew 7 and verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice He's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it, it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And so COVID-19 has come down. The cases have risen. We've not been able to meet. There's been economic, financial, emotional, physical challenges that have gone on. But how has your spiritual house done? Because if it is built on putting the word of God into practice, these things will not shake you spiritually. And I know sometimes it's hard here because we want to go, yeah, but yeah, but but the Bible is the Bible, okay? You 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 can we we can all come up with the reasons why I've struggled. What the Bible says is, if I'm rooted in putting the word of God into practice in my life, even when I go through the hardest things that can come my way. The house will stand strong. And so if you're wondering what, 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 what's going on, am I struggling spiritually because we have not met together? That, that's not in here. 
Am I struggling spiritually? Because I know I've been putting the word of God to practice in my life. You know, the second source of Jesus' strength is that his strength was under the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, um, I remember as a young leader, one of my favorite passages about Jesus was Jesus in the temple. You know, Jesus walks in the temple. He gets upset with what he sees. He's flipping tables. He's chasing people out. He's got the whip swinging around. And, uh, you know, and we can, we can sometimes look at that and just go, you know what? Yeah, it's like Jesus just lost it, right? But when you really study out the scriptures, what you find out is that Jesus, actually, this was something that he carefully thought through. He was prayerful about. It was actually a very strategic challenge of religious hypocrisy in the center of Judaism. It wasn't Jesus having a fit of rage and losing control. The fact is, we never see the apostles doing something like this, okay? Jesus, had, Jesus like, this is my temple, okay? It's like, somebody, it's like somebody coming into your house and messing it up, all right? You can't just walk into other people's houses and, and, and start yelling at people because uh, the house is a mess, right? You can't say, hey, you know what? Clean up your dishes and, and all that. But, but, but somebody comes in your house. Well, Jesus like, this is my house. But the reality is what you see more with Jesus is you see the power of Jesus, the strength of Jesus under the control of the Holy Spirit. You know, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter draws out his sword, cuts off a guy's ear. And Jesus tells, tells Peter, put the sword away. And then he says, do you not think that I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Matthew 26, verse 53, Jesus, look, I have amazing power. I could unleash it. But that would not accomplish the will of God. Jesus's strength was under the control of the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. He says, to this you were called, because Jesus suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus was self-controlled. His strength was under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. You know, what's interesting about this passage, if you look at this passage in the context, it the verses preceding it are dealing with political, and social issues. The verses after it are dealing with husbands and wives. And I thought about that. I thought, wow, isn't this amazing? As he's talking about political stuff, as he's talking about social injustice, Jesus says, you know what? You still need to be under the control of the Spirit of God. As you're dealing with things that are going on in your marriage, he says, guess what? You need to be under the control of the Spirit of God. He says, in fact, we are supposed to be like Jesus. What did Jesus do? He didn't retaliate. He didn't respond to insults. He trusted God. He, he, he didn't react. He was controlled by the Spirit of God. And so as we deal with political things, as we deal with social things, as we deal with things in our family and marriage dynamics, we're called to keep our reaction under the control of the Holy Spirit. 
You know, we talk a lot about this, but look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5 kind of tells us how we're supposed to act. And he says in verse 22, and we, we, we know this, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Why do I want to read this passage? Because the Spirit that you and I have, the Holy Spirit of God, is the same Spirit that Jesus had. And so we are called to show that same strength under the control of the Holy Spirit as Jesus. You know, this is a challenging list for me. And I've often said that I believe that there are people that have certain qualities of the fruit of the Spirit just kind of naturally, right? I mean, you know, there are people you're around and, and you get the sense that they've just always been joyful their whole life. Or they seem to be just a, a really kind person or, or, or just gentle. And I, I've known people like that who aren't even Christians. But you know, when I look at this list, there's actually nothing in this list that is naturally occurring with me, like nothing. It is like a description of the exact opposite of my sinful nature. You know, I, I, you know, patience, that has been, w- without the Spirit of God, I, I would never have patience. I, I used, to, I, I joked way back one time, I said, you know what, I have lots of patience because I never use it. Um and, you know, it's just all stored up. I'm like, man, I, I need the Spirit of God to be patient. I need the Spirit of God to be gentle. I'm not, I'm not a gentle person. This year, one of the biggest things I, I, I came to conviction about is that I do not have a kind heart. You know, I, I, I work at trying not to say unkind things, and I still blow it. I work at trying to not do unkind things. I still blow it. But what I realized is too often I'm trying to control what comes out of my mouth or trying to control my actions, but my heart needs to change. I don't have a kind heart because a lot of times my first reaction internally to something is an unkind response. Then I have to like work and pray and get where I need to be. But I'm like, this is something that really needs to change to be a kind person from my heart. You know, Jesus talks about self-control. And it's interesting that, that, that he puts it at the very end because I'm like, it's almost like, you know what? You need the spirit to be controlled in all of these other areas. You know, in this list, I don't see things like righteous indignation, confrontation, speaking up, standing up for my rights. I don't see things like being mean or mean-spirited or grumpy or critical or negative or cynical or attacking or bitter or angry. You know what? That's not in the, those things tend to be another list, the list of the sinful nature, but they're not not in the fruit of the spirit. And I want you to really think as you look at this list and filter what you say through the fruit of the Spirit. Filter what you send through the fruit of the Spirit. Filter what you post through the fruit of the Spirit. And then even going deeper, filter what you think through the fruit of the Spirit. Here's the thing. We look at Jesus and how he was, and we are in awe of it. But you and I, we have that same spirit. And God gives us the strength to be who we aren't in our sinful nature. Let me repeat that. God gives you and I the strength through his spirit to be who we are not in our sinful nature. So I don't have to be the impatient, the harsh, the angry, the selfish, the prideful, the unkind Doug Lambert, who, which is who I am. I can actually be 
a man of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, Jesus' strength was devoted to God and to other people. You know, we, we're all impressed by great feats of strength, right? I mean, in, in any field, you know, someone is, is incredibly smart and, and, and educated and, 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 and man, when you just listen to him, you're like, man, this dude is really smart. It's impressive. We're impressed by athletic accomplishments, right? By, by people who can, you know, whether well, they can throw a football a long way or they can score a lot of points or they, or they can kick a goal or they can lift a lot of weight or they can run great distances. We're impressed by athletic abilities. We're impressed by people who are successful in their careers, entrepreneurs. Uh, people can make a lot of money and, and build a business and, and accomplish great things. We're impressed by people who are, who are super talented, uh, you know, artistically, musically, that, that can do certain things. We're, we, we're in all of all those things. But I want you to think for a second. Think about Jesus. He knew the scriptures better than anybody. anybody. He could rattle off the scriptures by memory. And not just that. When you look at the Gospels, everything that Jesus says is like spot on perfect. I mean, it's like, he's like, not only is he smart, He's like so wise. I mean, it's just, he always has the right thing to say. You're like, wow, it doesn't matter what the situation is, friend, foe, uh, tired, not, he always seems to have the right thing to say. Secondly, you know, people have accomplished a lot of pretty amazing things athletically, but Jesus is the only person to successfully walk on water and not sink. Okay, Peter walked on water, but he's saying, I mean, that's pretty impressive. Can you imagine watching a triathlon uh, meet? And, you know, when, when, when the guys jump in the water, you see a bunch of guys swimming, and then one guy's just walking across the water, maybe running across. I mean, he would crush it. He'd be like, good grief. I've never seen anything like it. Okay, Jesus walked on water. You know, you, you, you think, Guys like Bill Gates or, or Jeff Bezos or, 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 or Bill Jobs are impressive and, and what they've been accomplished and how they've made their businesses grow. Well, when they gave Jesus five loaves and two fishes, he multiplied it to feed somewhere between five and 10,000 people with leftovers. Okay, so that, that's like about, uh, uh, about a 10,000 to one return on the investment. Pretty impressive, okay? And as talented as people are, a lot of times when somebody's really talented, they're, they're talented maybe like in one or two areas that they're great at. You know what they said about Jesus? He does all things well. That's actually, for me, the most personally challenging verse in the entire New Testament. It's like Jesus did all things well. He, he had no weaknesses. He, had, he, didn't, he, went, he didn't have something where he was really good at it, but he stunk at other things, right? Sometimes we'll look at an athlete He's a phenomenal athlete, but he's a terrible husband, terrible father, lousy character, um, all these other things. He's like, well, you know, I mean, he, he, he is a great athlete. That's what he's got going for him. Jesus did all things well. But Jesus' strength was not devoted to self-glorification. It wasn't devoted to making a lot of money for himself. It wasn't devoted to show people how impressive he was. It was devoted to serving God, and to helping other people. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 14. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. 
See what Jesus says? He's like, nobody can harm me. Nobody makes me go to the cross. I chose to do it and I choose. He says, I, I, I choose to lay my life down. And I do it to please the Father, but I do it to bring other people to the Father. Jesus laid down his life for you, for me, but he laid it down for others. He said, you know what? I, I've, got, I've got this innumerable amount of sheep that need to be brought in. And my goal is to lay my life down to bring them in as well. You know, right now, right now, we've got the same call to lay our life down for others. You know, in John chapter 12, just two chapters later, Jesus shares this. In verse 23, he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And we see that, right, in Jesus. But the very next verse, he says, The man who loves his life will lose it while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. You know, Jesus' strength was devoted to God and others, and the strength that we get from God is needs to be devoted to God and other people as well. It needs to be devoted to caring for our spouses and our families. It needs to be devoted to helping our brothers. You know, about a year ago, when everything got shut down, and, and, and Jennifer and I knew that we wouldn't be able to, do, to attend stuff for a long, long time, I, I was concerned about just there were a handful of married brothers. I thought, you know what, these are people that could really fall through the cracks during this time. And I made a list. It was a list, I think, of probably about, about seven or eight different brothers. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to start calling these brothers every couple weeks. And I'm just going to call just to talk to them and check on them because th these are just guys that I, that I just, they're not as connected as they need to be. We could lose them during this time. And so I just started calling them. And about every two or three weeks, I would call. Sometimes I would get them, we would talk. Sometimes I'd just leave a message. Sometimes I would send a text. Sometimes they would respond. Sometimes they would but I just kept at it. And four of the brothers were actually in uh, one of our small groups that really wasn't a functioning group. They weren't meeting. The, the, the leaders really um, just weren't in a position to, to, to lead the group. And so that, that actually became an even greater concern. And so I, I really hung in there with these brothers. Well, about um, a couple months ago, my wife and I, uh, just in some transitions we're making, uh, talked to our leadership group about, hey, what would you guys think about us taking over this, this group, this, this non-group group, right? The group that doesn't really do anything. And they're like, sounds great. We talk, I talked to the leaders and they're like, absolutely, we, we, we can't do it. Talk to other people. And so we, we started meeting about a month ago. And, and, and we have our small group Zoom get-togethers. And these are all, these are all it's, uh, uh, including us, it's five couples and one woman with a husband who's not a Christian. All of them in their in their fifties uh, or, or older. Uh, all their children are grown. So we started meeting, and we've had great attendance, great participation. We had a D group last Sunday with the men that was like phenomenal. I mean, I'm talking about guys getting open and real and vulnerable and crying together and helping each other. Uh, it's been amazing to see. We've got. Uh, a, a non-Christian couple that's that's joined us for a couple times that I think is going to start studying the Bible soon. We made a list of everybody's adult children, uh, and because of the group, very few, hardly anybody has kids who are currently disciples, and we're like, we're praying for each other's kids, but it's been incredible. It's drawn us close together, but I share this because for that entire year that I was calling those brothers, I can say with absolute certainty, there was never one time where any of them initiated a phone call to me. They responded, they would, they would get back to me, 
but just where they initiated it. And I just say, you know what? I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to pour myself out for these guys to, to keep them connected, to bring them back. And now, I, I, honestly, I, I feel like we have one of the best small groups there is. We're working together. We love each other. We're, we're talking. Uh, we're helping each other. We've got um, physical challenges. Two of the wives in our group have cancer. We got some mental health challenges. Uh, we, we've talked through just issues going on with, with the racial tension. Our, our group, it's, it's funny, we have uh, five uh, African-Americans in the group and, and six whites. And so we've had really good discussions about that and how people are feeling. But it is an incredible group. And I've watched how it got to work. And we have never met together physically this entire time. Not, not with anybody in the group because of, of just unique health challenges everybody has and being careful with covid but God is calling you and I to use the strength he gives us, not just to hang in there, not just to be strong, not, not just to make it, but to devote ourselves to other people and to the lost. I, look, you think, you think this past year has been hard on you? Guess what? You've had help. You've had the, the, the hope from God and help from other people. People out in our society, a lot of them are by themselves. They have nobody. They, they, don't have, they don't have a group like, like, like last Sunday, a group of men and they can sit there and, and you can share what's going on and, and your struggles and how, you're, how it's impacting you and, 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 and people loving you and crying together, and praying together. And let me tell you something, men, men in their 50s don't have groups like that. And they need what we have. God We'll fill you and I up as we pour ourselves out for other people. You can never pour yourself out to the point where there's nothing left because God will continue to fill you up. Isn't that what he says here? When a seed dies, what it produces many seeds. He says the man who loves, loves his life will lose it, but the man who hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus, it's the exact opposite. The more you focus on yourself, the less well you'll do. The more you focus on other people, the better you will do. It's an amazing thing, but that is a spiritual principle. No one has ever been as strong as Jesus. Not physically strong, not emotionally strong, but spiritually strong in his heart, in his character, in his love. And because he was rooted in his relationship with the Father, because he was under the control of the Holy Spirit, because his strength was devoted to God and one another, not only is it something to inspire us and amaze us, it's an example that we can imitate and follow and live out in our lives. You know, in Hebrews chapter two, and we'll close out here as we prepare for communion. And I referenced this at the beginning of my message, but I want to read it here. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in the humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely is the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You know, as we take communion, remember what Jesus did for you and I on the cross, the atonement that he made for us, how he took our place. But then, also remember what he continues to do for you and I. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus never intended the cross just to be something to be grateful for and to be in all of and amazed at. It was about something that would change not just our lives for, for eternity, but to change who we are right now. Because his strength can be our strength as well. Let's pray together. 
God, we are so grateful for the example of Jesus. We, we, we continue to be amazed at him in every way. Father, but we also are grateful that he went to the cross for us, that he, he didn't use his strength for his own gain, but rather, God, his strength was really devoted to bringing uh, each one of us into a relationship with the Father. And we, we are grateful that he continues to help us. He continues to strengthen us. He continues to, to draw us to you and to help us overcome temptation. And God, to help us be who you want us to be and not be who we are in our sinful nature. Thank you for the continuing power of the blood that works in our lives. It's for your son that we pray. Amen.